There we go. It's a little better. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome back to another Our Universe Revealed. Um, thank you for those joining us in person as well. We have a good bunch of people online as well this evening. So welcome, everybody. Um, some new faces. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm Jonathan Crass. I'm the series coordinator for Our Universe Revealed, and we will be continuing these talks um, throughout the rest of the semester. So we're back in two weeks' time um, talking about neutrinos that I'll tell you more about. Um, at the end. But tonight, um, it's our pleasure to welcome a visiting professor, um, the Glynn Family Visiting Professor of Physics to Notre Dame. Um, I was just talking to Alfredo and saying it's one of the longest titles we've had of one of the speakers so far um, for the series. And he's visiting us from uh, the Universidad de Colima down in Mexico um, and is here with us to talk to us tonight about scientific theories. So we have our theories about how the universe works. And the question is, well, how do we come up with those theories? And in particular, one of perhaps the most elegant theories, beautiful theories people might talk about and say them, is the standard model of particle physics. So he's going to talk a little bit about that tonight. So let's give him a nice warm welcome. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation, the opportunity to talk to you. So since we have a small audience, um, in, in person small audience, I would like to make this more intimate. And so I always like to you know, engage the audience into the discussion. So, so what I'm gonna do is that, well, first of all, let me just read what you can read there, the title of my talk, which is the, the most beautiful theory so far. Now, I, I didn't bring, um, I changed at the last minute the transparencies, but I want you to listen to the following word, pencil. Now, I would like you to raise your hand. This usually works with more uh, people statistically, but if you thought of it as yellow, it should be around 75% of you. Okay, what about green? One. Red or black? Okay, so I'm not a psychic, uh, but you know, um, for every single word that we hear, we immediately come up with an idea. And then if we think a bit more, the idea gets bigger and more complicated. So the thing I want you to help me with tonight is I'm going to flash a word. Well, first, I'm going to repeat the title. The most beautiful theory so far. And I want to discuss at least two words in this title in order to understand what we're going to do for the rest of the evening. And so one of the words is, of course, beautiful. And the other one is theory. So now I need help. When you hear theory, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The first thing, not the sophisticated one. Anyone? Physics. Okay. Anyone else? Einstein. All right. Theory is a word that we use in many settings, not only in science. And in fact, uh, even in science, between different sciences, we always mean kind of the same thing, but we use it loosely. Loosely. For today's talk, theory is going to be the set of ideas even a better word would be hypothesis that have been verified to be correct. So when I speak of a theory tonight, that's what I mean. I don't mean something that we still need to check. What I mean is something that we have checked. And, the, and so that we have a level of certainty on their usefulness or correctness. In science, there is no such a thing as an absolute truth. We always have truth to a certain degree of accuracy. Okay? So that's what I'm going to mean by theory. Next word. Well, 
colloquially, this is what I mean by theory and science. No BS. All right. Now, next word. Beautiful. First thing. Elegant. Flower. Beautiful. Over here. The first thing that comes to your mind when you hear beautiful. Complex. Nature. Beautiful is more difficult. And of, your, of course, scientifically, it is as wide as non-scientifically. The kind of beauty that I want to try to explain to you today is a beauty that I feel and that I found that colleagues of mine, somehow, we're able to relate to that. And it has to do with mathematics. It has to do with understanding with a feeling that one can get when one can understand something mathematically. Now, I'm not gonna do math. In order to try to give you a little bit of an idea of what I mean, I'm going to give you an anecdote. Of course, what's the most beautiful thing on earth? Uh, uh, baseball, right? Good. So that we can all relate to. It's the most beautiful thing that has been invented. And so when I was a kid, I used to play baseball. And I remember this time when the coach, uh, we were in a training and the coach was, you know, hitting some uh, fly balls so that we would catch them and we were practicing. And after a few of them, I was really exhausted. And I just dropped on the grass behind, a few, a few feet behind the coach as he continued to throw more. I was really exhausted and really relieved of being just lying there on the ground. And I started watching from that perspective, from the ground, behind the coach, when he hit the balls. And I started looking at the trajectories. And I was, I don't know, I was eight years old, something like that. And so I saw the trajectories and they looked kind of nice. I had never seen them like that. Maybe it was because I was tired. Uh, something was in my mind that... I looked at them and I thought, oh, those are kind of interesting. And you, of course, know what type of trajectory they were. Then I realized, I don't know why, maybe because it was something recent in school, uh, that I was taught, and this is not working. Ah, there it was. I was taught this equation, which is a very famous equation that if you went to elementary school, you might remember, is the quadratic equation in the solutions, and it's called a parabola. And as I was lying on the ground and looking at these trajectories, since I had just seen these at school, believe, it, believe me, it was just very recent that I had seen this at school. I saw ah, this, these trajectories look like this thing, upside down. I didn't tell anyone. This is something that I was thinking to myself. You know, I say, hmm, they kind of look like parabolas. As I say, I didn't tell anyone. Uh, I was afraid they would change my hat. However, a couple of years later, when I was like into middle school, they taught me at school that the trajectory of any object thrown in, up in the air follows a parabola. This was, I don't know, two years after that or something like that. Can you imagine what I felt when I heard this in class? Well, the first thing, since I'm very self-centered, I thought, oh, she's, I must be a genius. You know, I already knew this without them telling me. But what I, what I want to stress today is that I really felt something that I call beautiful. And like anything, some of this beauty comes to us naturally. Some of it has to be acquired. So for example, who here likes classical music? Okay. Did you like it from the very first time you heard it? No. How many people in here like um, Vietnamese food? Beer. <laughs> 
Did you like it the first time you took it? Probably not. I mean, there are some people that from the very first sip, they get hooked onto it. <laughs> I know a few. But, but, you know, some things require time and getting used to the details to start feeling things like beauty. This is one of them. So I felt it as being beautiful. And then I started looking at these diagrams and I made the mistake that I avoided before of telling my baseball buddies and it, it just didn't go well enough. But then I started also, I knew what an ellipse was mathematically in my classes. They, they have taught me what ellipses were in circles. And then I found out that Kepler had shown that planets revolve around the sun in ellipses. And I said, well, that's really cool. And then I found out as I was moving on to school that things like springs and pendula describe circles in some magical way. And so that was very nice. It was all very nice and somehow I found it interesting and beautiful. But then as I was growing older, I started asking why. Was this a coincidence or not? And so um, it came Isaac Newton okay, with the force. Everything is the force. Newton was able to explain a little bit beyond just describing. So before that, everything that I've been told, that I was told is that, yeah, a, a baseball describes a, a, a parabola. The planets describe ellipses. The pendula describes circles, but they didn't explain why. I found it beautiful, but at some point I also wanted to know if we knew why. Then Newton comes along and says, well, there is this thing called force that I'm pulling out of here. And this thing, I give you an equation that says that force is equal to mass time acceleration. And I'm not going to explain what mass is, neither acceleration. You all have an idea of what those things are. The important thing is that he gave us an equation that we could use for baseballs and for planets to determine how they move. And so with that equation, we would predict or explain the kind of movement that things would happen. And, and what, what this equation accomplished is that it showed me mathematically that there was no choice, that if I throw a baseball on the surface of the earth, it has to describe a parabola. And that's a very powerful, and beautiful concept. So this was nice, but it, it, didn't, it didn't stop there. This did. Newton also introduced something called the force of gravity that allegedly keeps everything moving around each other, including the baseball, the pendulum, the spring, the moon, the sun. And he claimed that this force was the same for all of those things. Furthermore, if I use the equations that he gave and solve them, turns out that anything that feels this force can only move in conic sections, meaning in a circle or in an ellipse, a parabola or a hyperbola, and that's it. And that's precisely what we see. These are called conic sections because if you have this white cone and you intersect it with a plane like such, what you obtain is a circle. If it has an inclination, it's an ellipse. If it's a further inclined, you get a parabola. And if it's vertical, you get the, the hyperbola. So now I knew why Kepler had found out that they were ellipses. But furthermore, I knew that whatever controlled this movement was exactly the same thing that controlled the movement of the moon and of the stars. So in a way, it connected me to the heavens. And I said, wow, this is beautiful. It made me feel part of something bigger. 
And also it allowed me to say, maybe studying things here, we can learn about things over there. And I found that idea also very stimulating. Okay. So once Newton invented this, all the scientists after Newton, particularly in the few, say decades after him, a couple of centuries actually, there was a new paradigm. You want to understand nature, find forces and solve them. The more complicated the systems, the more difficult to solve. And during those two centuries, there were several techniques invented by several people like Hamilton, Euler and Lagrange that allowed people to solve a lot of beautiful and very difficult problems using the idea of Newton. And this was 17, 18 and 19th century physics. And we learned a lot of things. And so physicists, particularly theorists, which are described here, were in love with the Lagrangian, solving everything, everything that they could see and feel. Well, not really. I mean, everything really? Nope. Something beautiful about science and nature is that there's always more, so we will never run out of jobs. We might have to change specific fields, but nature is always more and more and more. So there will be a job for scientists. And in particular, during those times, it was very well known that not everything was gravity. There were some phenomena associated to what we call the electricity and magnetism. And it was Maxwell, another famous name in the mid 19th century that discovered that electricity and magnetism were actually the same thing. And the goal of theoretical physics is to be able to describe nature with a set of equations that fit a t-shirt, okay? So Maxwell did a very good job because he was able to describe all electromagnetic phenomena with four equations that fit in a t-shirt. The important thing about these equations for this talk is that he found that what we used to call electrical phenomena, like thunders, uh, storms, and things like that, and magnetic phenomena with magnets, they are basically two phases of the same phenomena. There is a symmetry between electric and magnetic, and that's why we call it electromagnetism. And so the relevant thing here is that we started in the mid 19th century to see that symmetries were somehow important in physics. And so we jump to the 20th century and I'm just going to flash some of the most important results and most important things that we have discovered in the past century. The first and foremost, by basically the one upon which everything is um, uh, cemented, is that a word? Yes, um, in English, yes, okay, is this one. The relationship between symmetry and nature. It turns out that Amy Neuter discovered, she was a mathematician, a German mathematician. She discovered something very important, mathematically, very beautiful. She discovered that symmetries in nature Mathematically, we can describe it in terms of finding symmetries in the equation that we call the Lagrangian, which contains everything that we want to predict. And furthermore, she taught us that lots of the things that we had discovered to be conserved were actually consequence of the existence of symmetries. I'm pretty sure you have heard the expression conservation of energy, conservation of electrical charge. You've heard that at some point or another. Well, these are things that people kept finding in the experiments for years, and they seem to be very powerful and very strong, but nobody knew why they were conserved. They were called laws, and they were implemented in every physical theory that we had, but we didn't have a reason for that. Then she comes along and tells us why these conservation laws are. They are consequences of something that we call symmetry in the universe. Now, let me, let me 
back up a little bit and let me give you another idea of symmetry. Consider a square. I have a perfect square here in my hands. Can you see it? It's yellow. Okay, it's perfect. I ask you to close your eyes and I rotate it 90 degrees. And then I ask you to open your eyes. Do you see any change? No. I do the same and I rotate it 45 degrees. Do you see a change? Yes, okay. So the first transformation was a symmetric transformation. It meant nothing happened. It turns out that for the equations that govern the universe, we can make this kind of rotations and transformations in a bit more abstract way, and the equations remain the same. And when that happens, there is a, there is a conservation law. Okay. And so now there is a new paradigm. Look for symmetries of nature, and you will find new conservation laws. And so people started working on that. And of course, uh, theorists were really in love uh, with these ideas. And so we started working in symmetries in everything, every symmetry that we could thought of, that we could think of. Okay, so here is one of the very first beautiful and completely outrageous developments of the 10th century, special relativity, which you, which you have heard. Who created special relativity? It changes the concept of time and space. And yes, it was Einstein who was able to explain and give us something very interesting. And there is a very famous equation for Albert Einstein that everybody knows. Um, and it basically said in a way that we have to replace Newton. So special relativity was proposed in 1905. And if proven true, it meant that Newton had to go away. That was a big deal. There, there were like 250 years of scientific discoveries and developments proven, scientifically proven. That means with certain accuracy, with a lot of confidence, very happy. And then suddenly comes this clown and tells us that everything is wrong. That was not taken lightly at the time. It took many years for people to realize that there was no clown. And then to make things even worse, a bunch of people started realizing that the microcosm was very different from what we observe and what we do. And quantum mechanics was born and it was born through the work of many, many different people. And this basically just came to say, you have to change everything completely. Forget about classical physics, replace everything. So physicists, you also replace them and put things like that. And since then, the name of the game has been, well, yes, Newton was very good. It explained a lot of things, but we have to correct it. What about electromagnetism? Well, we also have to correct it, but it turns out that electromagnetism had a very interesting fact. Uh, so here's again electromagnetism from Maxwell. And it turns out that actually Maxwell found symmetries. That's where I introduced the word when I was talking about, about Maxwell. And it turns out that Maxwell has a very beautiful way of writing his equations. So not only on a teacher, it, it, it fits on a sleeve, and it's consistent with special relativity. And so if you can do that, that means it's better. Okay, let's keep that, that principle for now. So it is consistent with special relativity. Wonderful. But it must also be consistent with quantum mechanics. So this is nice, but not yet beautiful. In order to make it consistent with quantum mechanics, something else had to be done. And is a theory that is called quantum electrodynamics that is consistent with both of them. This, this part right here is exactly electromagnetism, but something had to be added. And the thing that had to be added was electrons and positrons. So mathematically, when people try to do this, 
they predicted the existence of something called antimatter. This was in the 19, late, mid 1920s, late 1920s. Nobody had ever thought of antimatter. They were just trying to make this beautiful theory of, of Maxwell consistent with the new ideas. And when they forced it to be consistent mathematically, whoop, said, no, it, it is only consistent if you have antimatter. And then people say, where is the antimatter? We have never seen it. Well, this was uh, Dirac. This theory, quantum electrodynamics, is the seed and in some way the prototype theory that allow us to get to the most beautiful theory that I will show you in the future. So it, it is really profound. Now, it's, it's mathematically beautiful, but it's more than that. It's remarkably beautiful because it works. And what do I mean by it works? I mean the following. 1933, March 15, so this day, the positron was discovered. The positron is the antimatter of the electron. And this is a picture of a bubble chamber. Those were the detectors that people used at those times where uh, the positron was detected. And I, I will point to you what, what, what is a positron in this case. So the positron is a charged particle like the electron. The electron is negative, the positron is positive. When a charged particle travels in a magnetic field, it bends. And if a negative particle bends like that, a positive particle bends like that. This is a bubble chamber. This is the track of a charged particle. The magnetic field was put in the experiment such that a negative particle would go like this. And so this was the discovery of positrons. And it was amazingly beautiful. That an, a very abstract, seemingly obscure mathematical idea had actually to do something with nature, something that we didn't even imagine before. This is really, really beautiful and impressive. Furthermore, as time went by, it turns out that there is something that every particle has that is called a magnetic dipole moment. It doesn't matter what it is. The point is that with the technology that we have, we have been able to measure this quantity for electrons with this precision. I want you to think about it this way. Can you tell me the length of your car? Roughly, 12 feet. How many? Okay, so she said 12 feet. Now let's suppose we go and get the owner's manual. Do you think they will give us inches? Like 11 feet, three inches? What about 10th of an inch? Or a hundredth of an inch? Does it make sense even to speak of that? No, okay. Here we have something that we are measuring to the 13th decimal place. We are able to do that. This is what we measure. Now we ask, what does Dirac say? What does the theory say? And they agree to this, to this level. There is no other calculation in physics, in any area of physics, calculation that agrees with an observation to this degree of accuracy. There isn't, okay? And so um, it is very impressive. It is extremely beautiful. It's, it's remarkable. Okay, so now interaction force turns out that this theory also tells us that electromagnetism, not only charge conservation, but electromagnetism itself is a consequence of asymmetry. 
And so now forces become symmetries. We are looking for symmetries and forces. We now only look for symmetries because we already incorporate forces into them. And that has uh, revolutionized the field for the past 50, 60 years. So it turns out that symmetry is also the origin or the reason for the interactions. I'm not gonna use the word force anymore. It's the same, but I'm gonna use interaction. And as I said, there's always more. A few years after quantum electrodynamics, people suspected of the existence of more forces for several reasons, more interactions, and we found the so-called nuclear weak and strong interactions. More interactions, therefore we need more symmetries. People started doing mathematics with new symmetries to see if they could explain the weak and the strong force. And that took about 50 years. Did it work? I guess you know the answer. The first, I'm gonna break it in two parts, although they, they, they happened more or less in parallel historically, but I'm gonna break it in two parts. So first, um, the electromagnetic force was united in some way with the weak force. And it was done by these three gentlemen, one of them still alive, Blaschow. Weinberg just passed away a few months ago and Salam died several years ago. They created something called the electroweak theory and it worked beautifully. I mean, incredibly. Orgasmic, truly, but relied on the existence of a new unobserved particle. For this thing to work, people found mathematically that there had to be a new particle. Again, something that nobody had seen and had no reason to suspect of its existence, except for this. Do you know which particle I'm referring to? It's called the Higgs. It made the headlines a few years ago. There he is. It was not done by him alone, but I don't know. His name is easier to pronounce or I don't know. It just, it just sticks to it, the Higgs. I think the other ones are French, that's probably why. Just kidding. This particle was finally found at the Large Hadron Collider after decades of intensive searches, both in the US and in Europe. The Large Hadron Collider finally found it. The Large Hadron Collider is an accelerator that collides protons that is built at the CERN laboratory in Geneva, France, Switzerland, France at the border. And it looks like this. Okay. Inside of it, it more or less looks like this. This is where the beam to destroy planets is created. So, so this is, uh, it's a 27 kilometer, 19 mile long tunnel with these huge tubes with magnetic fields that accelerate protons in two directions at nearly the speed of light, 0.9999. Nine, nine, one times the speed of light. And then they collide them. And when, 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 when these things are collided, there is a lot of energy in a very small region and a lot of matter gets created. So I usually call, these, these things happen inside of a detector, a, a, a huge, huge, huge apparatus with many different technologies. So what I usually do say about my experimentalist friends from, from that work in these things is that, uh, you know, they are like scavengers. The, the protons collide and a lot of stuff comes out and they have to go and look for things that are precious, unknown. And it's a very difficult, laborious work. And here's a picture of one of such detectors. It's an old picture. This is a, a human being for scale. So the beam of protons is like, if you were a beam of protons and you were approaching the detector, this is more or less what you would see. And from behind, there would be another beam and you would collide with that beam at the center of this structure. Okay, let me play a small animation of what I just said. What you will see 
is uh, whenever you see this thing, it's like a bunch of protons. Okay, let's see it. So this is supposed to have sound, but it's not working. Doesn't matter, it's not important. The other one will be though. So here's the bunch of protons being accelerated per, uh, yeah, in two different directions in the big accelerator. These names are the names of different detectors. Uh, here's the uh, graffiti for physicists, and, and this is the, uh, the, you know, the tunnel border between France and Switzerland. And then inside is the proton, a bunch of protons moving at over speed. And then they go from the other side. They don't know. They don't know, but from the other side, somebody else is coming. And right at the middle. And a lot of stuff comes out. A lot of stuff gets produced. And that stuff gets in, embedded into the detector. Then, through very fancy electronics, get into the computers of the scientists trying to find. Okay, this is more or less how it works. Nice. So, in 2014, the scientific community and the public saw for the first time this graph. And this is one of those graphs that is not only beautiful, it is also Nobel Prize awarding in the following sense. So I want you to concentrate just on this and I'll try to explain what it means. So you see a dashed red line. That is a mathematical, physical prediction of what an experiment should observe if there is no Higgs. The dashed red line. The solid red line is the mathematical prediction if there is a Higgs with certain mass. And the black points is what the LHC saw. So when we saw this picture, you know, we started opening champagne bottles. Well, in, in, in my case, they were tequila bottles, but it doesn't really matter. We were just drunk and happy. And, 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 and it verified a very fundamental theory, a very beautiful theory that made us feel confident on what we are going to do next. It's very beautiful. Here's my, my, my colleagues, experimentalists. They look like that. There are thousands of people working in these experiments in many different ways. As I said, this happened in parallel to the strong force. I haven't spoken about the strong force. And it turns out that it is also described as a symmetry. It's called quantum chromodynamics, QCD for short. And this was done by many people, but these two are key figures during that development. And so, we called all of these together the standard model of elementary particles. There is also a standard model of I don't know what else, but this is the real one. There is, yeah, so it is a theory. It's not a model. It just has the name because it started out as a, as a model. You know, like the atom. You know, an atom is div divisible but atom means indivisible. And so we screwed up and we just keep the name to remind us that we screwed up. Well, in this case, we didn't screw up. We just started with a model, got used to it, and it took too many years to prove it right, that people keep the name standard model. But it should, this is a theory and is the most beautiful one. These, these letters here are just fancy letters to describe the symmetries of QCD and electroweak, and then how this symmetry goes to electromagnetism through the Higgs mechanism. I just had to put those things on a blackboard because they also fit on a t-shirt, okay? And as you are familiar with the periodic table of elements, this is now the simplest reduced 
fundamental set of particles that make up everything that we can see in the universe. We have six quarks that make up the protons and the neutrons in our atoms. We have six leptons out of which one of is the electron that is also in our atoms. Among the leptons, there are three things called neutrinos that are very weird. And they are called neutrinos because they are neutral and inos, small. And then these red ones are just the particles responsible for the interaction. So the photon is the one responsible for electricity and magnetism. The gluons, they stick protons together. That's why the gluons, very, very creative, poetic name. And, and even more, the Z and the W bosons. I guess the X and Y and they were taken. I don't know. Anyways, and the Higgs boson. Now, it's not only beautiful, it is the deepest and most interesting thing achieved by human brains. This is a subjective statement, but it's true. And this proves it. What this is, is a bunch of, every row is a test of the standard model of something that we measure and we compare to calculation. And if it falls off, these lines is wrong. And it's just amazing. And this has been done over decades and it keeps getting better and better and better. So it is really amazing. Now, I'm almost done. But there is a, a small part of the title that I haven't talked about. The um, so far that should lead you to believe that there is something beyond this, and yes, there is. The standard model is not complete, this theory does not describe everything in the universe and is not set to do it, which is very important to say because otherwise it would be wrong. There are just things in this ocean that cannot be fished with this net. The net is very good. There is nothing wrong with it, but there are some fish that just don't fit. So we have to extend it. And things that do not fit are things like neutrinos, dark matter, and perhaps this thing called gravity. So neutrinos, neutrinos are tiny particles, very beautiful. Uh, very strange because it turns out that the, in, the, in, in the standard model, they are massless, but we have found that they are massive and they oscillate among each other. And we've done many, many experiments out of which I want to single one, which is the Super Kamiokande experiment in Japan, which is there is a mountain. Inside of the mountain, there is a cave. Inside of the cave, people constructed a water tank, cylindrical water tank, of these dimensions. Inside of the water tank, on every single space on the wall, there are photo detectors, apparatus that detect light. And they built it to discover something called proton decay, but they didn't discover proton decay. They were able to measure neutrinos. In the inside, it looks like this. It's pretty amazing. These are some grad students cleaning the tubes as the water is increasing. It is really an amazing place. Now, it so happens that when neutrinos hit the water, they produce particles that travel faster than light in water. Nothing can travel faster than light in vacuum, but light travels slower in water. And so, in principle, another particle can travel faster than light in water. And when that happens, this particle emits radiation in a very beautiful cone of blue light. And if these photodetectors see that beautiful cone, we know there was a neutrino there. That's basically the idea. So remember, it's a cylinder. Remember, it's a cylinder. So this is the sun. Beautiful. We're, we are alive thanks to this thing. 
This thing is a thermonuclear reactor. And this thermonuclear reactor has a depth, a core in many different areas. And what we see from the sun is the light that comes from the surface. Because the light that gets produced in the center gets absorbed and reabsorbed, absorbed and reabsorbed. And in order to understand the sun as a thermonuclear reactor, we have pretty good understanding, but we would like to see its interior, not only its surface, but we cannot get photons from the interior. But in these nuclear reactions, photons and neutrinos are emitted, not only photons. And the, and the sun is practically transparent to neutrinos. They are so feeble. Their interactions are so feeble that it's like there's no sun. They just go out of the sun. So if somehow we can detect one of those neutrinos, we will have information from the inside of the sun. And so this is what Super Kamiokande did. This is the, 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 uh, the cylinder of detectors. If I generate a cone of light inside, when the cone hits the, 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 the wall of the photomultipliers, it forms an ellipse or you know, a conic section. And this is something very nice. So just imagine for humans to be able to see the interior of the sun, we need to see a, a, a small blue beautiful light inside of a cave, inside of a water tank. Now, if you don't think this is beautiful, then there is something wrong with you. I'm sorry, but it is. And this is a picture that you get from the interior of the sun in neutrino modes with the resolution that we have now from Super Kamiokande. The colors are associated to the energy of the neutrinos. And it is consistent with everything we know about nuclear physics so far. So it is a beautiful picture. Now here, close to where you are, there is an, ex oh, sorry, not this one, this one. There is an experiment that is called DUNE, the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, that is located at Fermilab in Batavia, Illinois, where neutrinos are created, dump into the ground, they travel through rock, and then they are detected in big labs thousand kilometers away. And we need to do that for the following. This is Fermilab, a Department of Energy National Laboratory near Chicago. It's the starting place for the deep underground neutrino experiment, DUNE, powered by the Long Baseline Neutrino Facility, LBNF. The experiment begins with Fermilab's accelerator complex, which moves protons close to the speed of light. It's all part of an effort by more than a thousand scientists from around the world to figure out how tiny particles called neutrinos work, and what role they play in the evolution of our universe. Neutrinos are the most abundant matter particles in the cosmos but very hard to catch. Trillions stream through you every second without leaving a trace. At LBNF, the beam of protons will smash into a target, creating the most intense beam of neutrinos in the world. Scientists will collect data to measure properties of neutrinos close to the source and again far away. Neutrinos change as they travel, so scientists are sending them straight through 1,300 kilometers of rock toward the dune detectors at the Sanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota. The detectors can also look for the birth of neutron stars and black holes by catching neutrinos from exploding stars. The one and a half kilometer deep detectors will be filled with 70,000 tons of liquid argon, making them the largest neutrino detectors in the world. As neutrinos interact with the cold liquid, they create a shower of other particles and light. Those particle tracks are then picked up by electronics and transmitted as data to the surface. The information will be analyzed by scientists at collaborating institutions in countries around the world. They'll use this data to solve unanswered questions about neutrinos, and maybe even figure out why matter exists. Things like planets, stars, and even you. Even you. So that's neutrinos. Now dark matter. What is this? No. 
galaxy. It's a, it's a picture of a galaxy. This is how we see it with our eyes and our telescopes. But it turns out that if we also take into account gravity, galaxies are more like this. What you saw before is this, but there is something else. We know it's there. We're sure it's there, but we don't know what it is. And since we are poets, we call it dark matter. I look for a picture of it, and this is the best I could get. <laughs> so we don't know what it is, but that doesn't mean we don't have hypotheses and ideas of what it is. And for the past 30 years, everybody that is working in, in high energy physics has their own antimatter, uh, uh, dark matter particle candidate. And we're waiting for experiments to confirm, most likely to deny our ideas. Finally, what about gravity? Well, the problem with gravity is that um, it's not consistent with quantum mechanics yet. And so there it is, there is no gravity yet. We need new generations to see if we can tame the beast and, and see if they can solve this problem. And with this, I just want to conclude with this picture to let you know something. I consider this painting extremely beautiful. Therefore, this is like a disclaimer. Everything I've said, I found incredibly beautiful. It doesn't have to be. It is, it doesn't have to be. Okay. And um, if you find this picture beautiful as well, then you might agree with me for everything I've said to this night. Thank you very much. And here's some contact information in case uh, you would like to get in touch. There is a, um, I have a, a, um, a podcast program, but it's in Spanish. So if, if you know someone that speaks Spanish and is interested in science, particularly kids, uh, let them know. And this is the info. Thank you very much for your attention.